Welcome to Pens Down. On this show, we engage journalists, whether they are active or otherwise, and get to them to tell us all that they went through or they go through in their line of duty. Journalism journeys, that is the subject matter we're talking. You know, the principles of news gathering does not allow the journalist to put in so much of his experiences because journalists are supposed to be observers, not participants. So on this platform, we tell the storyteller stories. The journalist becomes the newsmaker, not the reporter or the presenter. Today, we are flying all the way to the beautiful coastal uh, area of Gambia, the Gambia. I think it's the only country in Africa that goes with a definite article for the name, the Gambia. And I've been joined by one of our senior colleagues there, he has over 20 years experience in, as a journalist covering the Gambia, working as a reporter, staff writer, and editor of several Gambian publications, as well as contributing to other international media outlets. He was arrested multiple times as a journalist between 2006 and 2014 by the regime headed by ex-president Yaya Jame and lived in exile for three years. And he was a key witness in a lawsuit filed by the Federation of African Journalists against the Gambian government at ECOWAS Court, challenging draconian media laws used to suppress journalists right under the former regime. He also worked as media officer and senior communications officer, respectively, at the office of the president in Banjul between 2018 and 2020. He currently works as a media consultant based in Banjul. Mr. Sana Kamara has joined us on Pens Down today. Thanks for your time, sir. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Right. I listened to a brief talk you gave at the Hague Talks on YouTube. And there you said in 2014, while you were working for the independent newspapers, a story you had done uh, struck the wrong chord within, within the corridors of power. And in early in the morning, your media outlet, the offices were surrounded by soldiers. It was a tip off you got that you shouldn't come to the office. That probably saved your life. Tell us about that incident. What exactly happened? Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, it's good to go down memory lane. Mm. <laughs> I, I hardly got asked this question these days. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm, 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 I'm thankful um, to God Almighty that I am alive today to tell this story. Um, a lot of my colleagues um, probably will have undergone some um, some, some psychological um, issues to reflect on these stories. And it's difficult for some of them to account as a result of what happened on that fateful um, um, morning. Mm. It was to 2006. Um, mm. um, there was a there was an announced military coup in the Gambia against Gambia. Um, okay. Whether it was real or one of the you know the several alleged coup attempts against the dictator at the time, we had several of those when he was in power. And the strategy was he uses this to neutralize his strong opponent in the military. Oh. And each time there is, an, there is a reported coup, we have a lot of generals that have been retired. Um, we've got some high ranking military officers who have been killed or who have been in prison. So this was one of those days when we had a then chief of army, army staff, um, Lieutenant Dur Durcham, um, who, who, another, um, who was involved in another alleged coup attempt. Um, our newspaper called The Independent. Um, at the time, we were the most critical paper in this country. Um, Notwithstanding the news, um, the, the news of the, the alleged coup, there have been a series of arrests. Now, what happens on the military dictators is that when they arrest people, you the loved ones start running to newspapers to find out and cry for help. My loved ones were picked up in the middle of the night. We don't know what has happened to them. We've gone to military installation A, we've gone to the intelligence installation B or the police headquarters, and there is none of them is taking responsibility for the arrest. Now, that enables us as journalists to document those lists. Okay. lists of people whose loved ones came forward and complaining that their loved ones were picked up overnight or two nights ago. And then we published this list in March. I can still remember it was in the month of March. 
But when we arrested, um, when we published this list of the arrests, um, the next morning, all we, I think by 4 a.m. or so, these soldiers were deployed at our offices. Um, and then in that early morning, I got the news that uh, our offices were already um, surrounded, so I shouldn't turn up for work. Um, at first, I wanted to flee. I mean, it's normal in the Gambia when, you know what I mean, when you have something like that. But I said, no, I shouldn't. Let me still observe the situation. But at least I was hesitant to go in the morning, like that early usual morning. Yeah. And some of my colleagues who did not get the news on time, by the time they realized or they got the news, they are already at the office and they were rounded up. You know, oh. I only showed later when already most of the staff were taken away. And this included our cleaners, our drivers, our security mm. guards. So people who have no direct link to even news production or news recording. And um, our editor, after some hours of interrogations at the police intervention unit headquarters, most of the staff were released, but they still held on to our editor uh, in chief and our general manager. Those two were detained for two weeks at the International Intelligence Agency, where they underwent a series of torture, including persecution. I think our editor in chief, when he got released, he had some broken limbs. Um, you can see some bayonet marks on his face. And this we are. Um, inflicted upon them by a team of soldiers they call the junglers. Mm. You know, and this was some space exit squad. Our paper actually never operated since then. Um, it was shut down for several years. The good thing is that um, I'm here today recounting this experience. But mm. the trauma alone, if you, even if you have physically undergone this, but seeing your yeah. colleagues to have, have under, it's enough to scare you away from the profession. Yes. Um, but, uh, for someone like me, um, it wasn't enough to scare me. So I continued reporting. I mean, until today, I'm still working as a journalist in the Gambia. So um, it was quite an experience from 20, 2006 um, until today. Before uh, you went into exile, I'm sure there were a series of actions that represented threat on your life. Those that compelled you to run into exile, were they then much more threatening or of greater intensity? Or you felt that the repeated actions were enough to tell you that your life was not safe? Um, thank you. I think um, uh, the one I just told you was the first experience, okay. you know, physical, um, like direct uh, threat that I faced. You know, a lot of our staff, editorial members, left the profession. Some left the country, lived in Dakar, others went to Ghana. Some proceeded from there to seek asylum outside. Um, I, I stayed in the country. It was difficult after that to even get a job because the other papers, they consider our, our core of journalists as the, the troublemakers. So they want to stay away from us. It was difficult to even get employment at the time. Mm. So you have to just do some bit of freelance work here and there to make ends meet. Until 2009, I was hired to work as the editor in chief for a new paper called The Daily News. Um, I was the founder editor and I worked there for a year. Uh, because my passion lied, um, lies, still lies in the news reporting, I am the one of the editors who will leave my desk and go into the field to do some investigative work and come back. Now, there was this instance, which was my second experience, where I got physically arrested, along with a colleague of mine called Mr. Seku Jame. Um, he used to be the former Secretary General of the Gambia Press Union. We, we went to the beach because, like the first instance, family members were coming to our office and declaring that they are loved ones. These are, there were a bunch of youths that work in the tourism area. These are mostly unemployed, so they work there to earn a living either as tourist guides or doing some kind of, you know, uh, informal jobs to get some income. Some of them will be lucky to um, to get some white women and then, you know, it was an opportunity for them to travel outside the Gambia. But there were a lot of um, also negative reporting that uh, they were contributing to Gambia being branded as a sex tourist destination. Mm. Now, the government at the time, their reaction to handling this was to deploy the military on the beach. And then they were physically manhandling these boys on the beach. Obviously, mostly the boys were the victims. The women were handling the victims. Now, um, when we got report of this manhandling, um, I went out with one of my reporters at the time, Mr. Seku Jame. Uh, we went into uh, we went to the beach to document some of this, to get physical evidence of these victims. Mm. And while we were there, um, interviewing the victims, some of them having some 
um, some fractures, some some injuries on their bodies. We're taking photos, doing our interviews. I mean, in the process, um, we just saw so ourselves being surrounded by red bears again, military, the military wow. police. This was my second experience of arrest. And then, um, I think during our investigation, we took photo of someone who at the time really did at the time of their arresting us, we had no idea. But this gentleman used to be the captain to the president's personal flight. Oh. You know, um, he he came under our radar because the issue of bomb stars is also related with the issue of PD failure in okay. Uganda. PD failure, yes. And then this guy happens to be with a girl that we saw to be definitely a teenager under underage on the beaches. And then where the military were beating the other guys or the other boys because of following this so-called white women. Um, of course, these ones were spared because they were girls that were going, you know, and of course, it's obviously against the laws of the Gambia. Uh, we have a we have a strict law on um, tourists who want to play on underage girls. Mm. There is also uh, a law in the Gambia that says that children under 18 cannot consent to sex. So in all manner, this has actually violated Your audio has gone off. Yes. Yes. One of those rare cases where you got evidence of what the you know the, the negative side of this. Then the guy, I think he called, because he knew we were a journalist, he called, made a call, and the next minute we know we are surrounded, uh, you know, and then we are taken away. Uh, we first we are taken to the police headquarters. There is a tourism security unit where we are affection. We to show, um, try to show them our credentials, but for some reason now they are considering our case as a threat to national security because this was the place that they told we are just you know like an espionage kind of thing imagine you as a journalist being escorted by a full pickup to your house where your family members are there and then they come in to come inside your house and then taking you away i mean obviously it's enough to even psychologically feel that you are going to disappear yeah you know, this was my second experience but after several hours we had to compromise and then um, we are only released on the condition that all the content in our cameras were to be deleted, nothing was going to be published. Obviously, if you have that option and the other option of being taken away by the military, we choose to survive to tell the story rather than, you know, the other option. This was my second option. Now, my third experience came in 2014 when I reported on trafficking in Pazi. There were Gambian girls who were recruited to go work in the Middle East, you know, as um, house, housemates or house helps. You know, but this also constitutes some form of modern day slavery. Um, we reported this because the police were having issues um, prosecuting the agents that were recruiting these girls and taking them away. The girls were calling back and then um, reporting about some of their experiences, you know, and then some parents were going to the police to report these matters. But the agents who were doing this saw it as a legitimate business because they are paying tax to the state. They were legally registered businesses in the Gambia. Mm. So we are strongly affiliated with the president's ruling party. But the mm. story, when I wrote about this story and published it, the president was in Malabo, um, it was an African Union summit. And then I think the story was picked up by the BBC. And he said this story caused an embarrassment to him, you know, among his colleagues. And before I knew it, I was picked up again, this time by the unit they called the Police Major Crimes Unit. And then I had to spend two days um, um, with, in a police cell. You know, along with criminals, you know, uh, it was tough for me to even get a bail. I can still remember how that night, that night in the police cell went. Uh, and then um, this, you know, some, it resulted, it accumulated into other activities. After I was released on bail, it took another eight weeks and I had to be reporting on at the police major crimes each time. Um, and then uh, despite condemnations and, um, um, so, um, uh, and then strong support or, or strong argument for my release, um, the, my colleagues in the media, fraternity, both locally, internationally, saw this as an intimidation tactic mm. that was being played on me, and that the facts of my story spoke for themselves. There was nothing wrong about what I reported, or there was nothing infactual about um, non-factual about it. Um, but then it became politicized because, uh, according to what my lawyers thought, if I had, if they had taken me to trial, I wouldn't get a fair trial. Mm. This happened at the time the judiciary in the Gambia. We are totally dependent on what we used to call mercenary judges. Mm. These were judges who were um, personally hired by the president from outside the Gambia to come and serve in the Gambian judiciary. Mm. They are personally paid for by the president, and then they get a lot of um, benefits. 
and then those that were considered opponents of the president were abroad before them. Mostly they have been taken to place. Hardly will you go there and you go to place. So my case was considered one of those kind of potential cases. And my lawyers believed that, that I wasn't going to get a fair trial, even if they had to put up whatever, whatever defense they could. And they think that I should consider my security options. Now, based on that, um, I was, uh, after eight weeks, I had decided to leave the country. But because it was based on the advice that we had yeah. from our Himalaya groups, um, from the lawyers, and also from some of our security experts. You know, I left the Gambia, I crossed the border to go into Senegal. I traveled overnight and I got to Senegal 2 a.m. at night because, you know, you have to find a way to get yeah. across the border without following the formal route. So <laughs> basically, this was my experience. When I left, this, when I left the Gambia in 20, 2014, I lived in Senegal and uh, from Senegal, I continued reporting on the Gambia. Um, until uh, the change of government in 2016-2017, when I returned home back to Gambia again. So basically, that uh, formed the basis of my living or fleeing the Gambia to live. The threats were clear and present dangers. Were there also times you were approached with bribes to compromise what you were doing, or all the time they came heavy-handed Setting you so that you stop what you are doing? Several times. I can't even count how many times. When I was at the Independent, I was um, I was offered a chance to go and work for a pro-government paper called the Delhi Observer. At the time, it was the Gambia's leading Delhi newspaper, but it was a pro-government because it was owned by the president. He mm -hmm. bought this. The founder of this paper was a Liberian refugee, Mr. Kenneth Best who came to Gambia during the Liberian War to set up the observer. But he was um, expelled from the country, and the president and his team took charge of the paper. Since then, the paper had been a pro-government mouthpiece. I was several times given an option to go work for that paper, where I will have got better pay. I will have faced less risk. You know, there were times that I was some of the strong allies to the president. People in very high positions of power were inducing me with monetary gains or monetary gifts. You know, I, I have never at any point in time accepted this. Um, actually, I stood true to my profession, my ethics, and my and my principles. Obviously, it means that in the other side, you are, even by looking at the other side, it's enough to convince some people to move on to work for the pro-government entity because they were having a lifestyle that is not at any level with what we, the independent journalists, we are going through. You know, a lot of my colleagues in the country went to outside and live there. I never, I never left. I stayed through to this profession, and and at, there was no point in time that I accepted anything like that. Uh, be it from 2016 um, until the time that I left the Gambia, I had not, I had not relented. I had not changed my style of reporting just because mm -hmm. I want to get any benefit from um, the state or oh, it's 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 um it's it's machinery. I will call it because you know the state as an entity also has some people in, in the private sector in the civil society who were operating at the behest of the population. So I, I, I had actually managed to stay very independent until today. Mm. Mm. This is interesting. Um, so how did, you be, how did you enter journalism? How did you choose journalism for a profession? Let's, let's go back to that, the starting point. Um, when I was going to school, I went to a high school called Amity. This was um, one of the schools that were uh, built by the colonialists in 1927 in the Gambia. And it was one of the, it was at the time, I think one of the only government boarding schools, either only or one of the only government boarding schools. Mm. But then it had this reputation of producing um, 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 future leaders um, with strong mm. abilities. But when I, I discovered some of my abilities when I was at going to the primary school, I had some thing for essay writing, you know, and when I was in the high school, I, I joined the press club, but I also wrote in the school magazine a number mm. of times. Uh, um, when there was, Gambia had its own first television station in 1995, and there was, I remember there was a youth show that was um, organized at the school. The TV came to look at the life that we experienced. And I don't know, for some reason, um, I was identified to be one of the people who speak for my colleague students at the time. Okay. You know, okay. All of this contributed, contributed to how I ended up becoming a journalist. I had that thing for journalism. 
for writing and for reporting the news um, ever since in those days. Obviously, in, you grew up in the village, you were listening to BBC Focus on Africa. You know, it was a very famous program that you had to learn a lot of things from around Africa or the World Service where you, you have to listen to some very famous journalists, you know, um, and then um, all of that contributed to me. When I left school in, in the year 2000, for some reason, this 2000 was a, was a very dark year in the Gambia's history because this was the year that there was some major, one of the biggest student protests that happened against the military government of Gambia. Mm. And then 14 students, 14 people were killed, including a journalist and a Red Cross volunteer, um, obviously, and the majority of them, I think 12 of them were students. You mm. know, and this happened right, right under my eyes uh, because mm. this was the, my 12th my grade and some of my colleagues were direct victims. I saw what they underwent at the hands of the military. And I, my, 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 my passion to report about this violation, this injustice, it just grew, grew stronger and stronger. Mm. So when I left journalism, I couldn't, when I left school, I couldn't do any other job. A lot of my colleagues at the Gamma, because of the lack of job or let's say career advices, we we'll choose to, some want to become teachers, some want to join um, the army. If you come from a high school, you join the security services, obviously you stand a chance for your promotion to become a cadet or something. I just choose to be a journalist because there was no school of journalism in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. you, undergo, you undergo what we call an apprenticeship. You know, mm -hmm. you work as an apprentice, you are attached to somebody in the newsroom and you spend a month, um, months um, to years, and then I spent about three years as a, um, as a cop reporter at the independent newspaper. Um, and mm. in the process, I was I was being assigned to go on coverage. Sometimes I have to go with my seniors to learn from them. When I come, I write the news. Um, the, the editors and the senior journalists will mentor you on what you should do. So I was learning on the job until um, by 2003, 2004, I was knocking the front pages. You know, mm. and then I, I've never turned back ever since. Uh, well, mm -hmm. This is how I, uh, my journalism, my journalism uh, I'm starting. Shortly after the Gambian election, the famous Gambian election in 2016, which brought Adam Abaro to the presidency, shortly after that, Yaya Jamet conceded defeat. One week later, he made a dramatic U turn. Uh, when he conceded defeat, for what you know, who you know him to be, were you convinced that he was being honest? I, I had my misgivings. We were in Dhaka, <laughs> um, and then we, for some reason, the community there, we all thought it's an opportunity to go home now. Mm. Um, remember, the president at the time was sworn at the, at the government embassy in Dhaka mm. because the president, the former president, wouldn't let Mr. the current president be sworn in the Gambia. Mm. You know, um, so after that inauguration, we even had a government community based in Senegal. We had a get together, like we came together and then celebrated victory and said that it's time for us to go home now. It's been so many years. I was there for three years, but there are those that stayed for 15, 17, 18, 20 years hmm. in exile in Senegal. They could have, they couldn't come home. It was, it was, you know, being among that community, you see people who, just be considering Gambia and Senegal, you will be in Senegal and then they, you get a call that your son died or your father died or your mommy died. Mm. You can only cry from there. You cannot even come home to come and give your family members defeating burial. You know, so when this opportunity to come home came, it was really joy, joyous. But at that event, I remember telling my colleagues, you know, I'm still not convinced that Baro um, Yaya Jame has considered it. <laughs> I still had my misgivings. I warned them and they said, no, no I mean, this is this is a, this is this is history for us. The guy has accepted. I think I said no. I think in fact there is a lot of time because he got about two months, almost, almost two months to the inauguration of the new president. Mm -hmm. I said this is a long time for Ross to allow this guy to stay in office. He may be contemplating other options. And people think I was just being a devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. I said, all right, I will, I will let's give him the benefit of the doubt. So I wasn't really surprised that he made a U-turn within a week or so later. He said that he is. <laughs> When it happened, I called my parents. I said, you know, I told you this. They said, you, are you are you a psychic or something? I said, no, I definitely know this guy very well. I reported on him for years, over a decade or a decade and a half. I mean, I could I could I could tell you sometimes when he made certain moves, mm. I could analyze and I tell you that this is going to be the outcome or this is going to be the next step. 
oh, this is going to be real. I had I knew this guy very well. So I was not surprised that he has got he had to make that U-turn and insisted that he's not going to allow the next president to come in. When you stepped in Gambia first after Yaya Jame had left power, were you convinced that this is a new atmosphere, a brush of fresh air, and that you were going to practice your journalism without the usual military detaining, arrest, and other things? Were you convinced that the atmosphere that had come was going to be the one you had always craved for all these years? Obviously, I was really convinced that we were going to have one of the uh, example, one of the best examples of democracy in um, in, in West Africa and Africa in general. Um, for us, it was remember Gambia had independence in 1965, mm. and uh, we had we had one president for 30 years. Our yes. first president over stayed in office. If you look back at his time in office, Jawara, we always say. That he, in my opinion, I think one of these setbacks of that regime, despite some great human rights records, some democratic uh, democratic credentials here and there, I think that his biggest mistake or our biggest error was to allow that guy to stay in office for 30 years. You know, mm -hmm. it formed the base. And when when the Yaya Jame came in, he also stayed for 22 years. I mean, he had cried for um, um, um for, for 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 building of strong institutions. We have cried for some very basic standards of democracy during that 22 years, not just about press freedom, but about overall governance structures and systems that we could have. You know, so when when the coalition, um, um, the opposition candidates came together to form a coalition, um, our 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 agenda. I mean, generally, I will say our agenda because as a journalist at the time, I was not only reporting, but I was a strong advocate. So I become part of the process to fight the case. We had a we had a very very solid very very formidable agenda of reform that was presented to the Gambian people and it was approved because overwhelmingly they voted for the opposition to change the president um the the the, the president at the time. I was very convinced that if we had come and then implemented all these things that we spoke about, or we promised to the people that in the Gambia, in the, in West Africa, you know, in Africa generally, and in the, within the international community, we were supposed to have. One of the most examples, like one of the best examples of democracy in, in, in Africa. Personally, when I came in, I I was working as an independent journalist in 2017. In 2018, um, there was some um, um advert. I was recruited to go work for the president as media officer. Mm -hmm. Um, this was because the team that were there with the president, some of them there were some still capacity issues, and then they had to um fire some some of them and then re-announce. Um, or for, for new applicants to apply for this job. At first, I didn't even bother to apply, but I was approached several times to say, you know, you are going to be a good fit for this. You are part of the struggle. You understand. Some of you should go in and work with the system, with the government, so you can serve as the conscience of the government. You can keep reminding them in case they want to derail. Because, you know, Africa, we had this, some of these um, um, stories of presidents coming to power, promising one thing, and once they are there, they change their thing. Yes. So I came in there, Fully convinced because it's the only time in my life that I had to work for for the state or for the uh, for the government. I had never worked for government in my career as well. So, so I that means, have... if I understand you, you worked at the office of the president not as a political appointee but as a professional. No, no. I went there as a professional. I was hired to work there as a journalist. I was hired as a professional. The position that I occupied, I, I, I held at that place was a professional position and it came because I had a clinical skill that we had required for that job. It wasn't a political effort. I went in that work as and that's why when I was working there and I realized that since we are no longer going the way that I expected them to be, I started speaking out from within. Mm. Before it got to a point that I had to it, you know, it became I had to eventually resign. I started speaking up against some of the things from within. You know, I saw a lot of things that were not going as promised, and I saw a lot of promises being broken. I saw the president stand, you know, before the Gambian public and announce that he was going to run for office, something that he promised. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I, my the phone just fell down. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Something that he promised was um he was never going to do. He promised to come and serve a three-year mandate. 
motive. One, it was changed to five years, and uh, before the five years could elapse, he announced he was going to form his own political party. This is a guy who never had a political party. He belonged to another political party, but because there was an agreement, a consensus among, among the opposition parties to say, because we have to come with a, with a reform agenda, a transition agenda. Anyone who is going to run as a candidate must represent the interest of all the political um, parties. So yes. he came in as an independent candidate to start a transitional three years term. During, during which term, he was supposed to implement all the reforms that were envisaged, that were planned. I mean, but by the time the three years um, elapsed, you look back, you realize that one third of the, of the, of the, of the, of the promises were not even met. Some are deliberately ignored. For example, we are supposed to have a new constitution because the constitution we had on the Jamia was butchered. The was constitution that was amended over 52 times. Mm. So we needed a new constitution that was going to meet at least some basic um, 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 standards of democracy. We were going to have some reform in the civil service. We were supposed to have reform in the security sector. We were supposed to have reform in the judiciary. We were going, supposed to have anti-corruption bodies. We were supposed to have uh, national human rights institutions. So it was, we were supposed to have reforms in the, in the elections. Remember in the elections, um, um, our reform agenda actually resulted in the killing of some opposition elements at the hands of Jamais agents. You know, and it resulted to some kind of revolution and some of the major political party leaders were always in prison as a result of that. So basically for me to continue working for a government like that and then ignoring all these promises is something that went against, against everything I believe in. Oh. At the time, um, um, I think my bosses were not very comfortable with my, my, my attitude because oh. they realized that I was, you know, mostly I was becoming somebody who is not tagging along with the agenda. So they couldn't fire me, I mean, I, I would say, because they really wanted me to continue working. But they have decided to move me from the president's office to move to the Ministry of Information, where I was supposed to work at, um, as a news editor for, um, for, um, in that ministry. And I said, no, I haven't come into this government to, um, to be used as a political tool, as a, as a political um, 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 apprentice, whatever you guys want to do it, I'm going to decide yeah. to leave government. And they, they, you know, they spoke to me and people called me to say, no, you should be considered this. I have got calls from very high places. People who were, the president never called me personally, but people who were very close to the president called me and then gave me options, gave me promises to say, no, you have to understand this. You can't leave this thing. I said, no, I'm going to leave. So I announced my resignation. I submitted my tenant my resignation and I announced on the media that I have resigned from government. And then um, because I gave my reasons why I resigned from government, to say that um, the government is not um, respecting the principles that were promised to the people. And it was good. I felt I felt very relieved for doing that because I, I wanted it to go on record that uh, this is the promise we made to the Gambian people, but we are, we are reneging on those promises. And for someone like me working in their witness and all of this to just look the other way. And, you know, I could have, for me, I could have stayed on if I had no principles. I wanted to enjoy it from the state because I could have stayed by now. I would have got probably some couple of million in my account. I would have been, you know, enjoying some good lifestyle, traveling with the president. You know, there are those that are there who have, you know, but I, I just, I just turned my back on all of that and said, look, I, it's better to, you know, live on principles, even if you're going to die poor, than to go along with something that is definitely going to continue to hunt you for the rest of your life. So I, I took a step back and said, no, I can't do this. So I gave up. I gave up and I resigned. In the midst of all the abuse you suffered, the arrest, detentions, and all that, what was the position of your family? Were they still happy? You were still holding on to journalism, which was obviously becoming a threat to your very life. My, my family, um, I think they just realized that uh, my dad will say that um, I'm a son that never listens to his father because <laughs> from the onset, he never supported <laughs> He never supported the idea of me becoming a journalist. My dad wanted me to be a medical doctor. I was a science mm. student when I went to high school, yes. Um, um, and he was going looking forward to his son becoming a medical doctor or something, not to be a journalist. So he never supported this. My mom, on the other hand, my late mom, she, um, she became late in 2004. They are about, um, she was, on the other hand, she was my biggest supporter. She believed in me and she supported me all along. Um, my dad, on the other hand, I think at some point he just gave up on me and said that if I die, then he would consider me. It was just a loss that he was asked to accept in good faith. You know, but um, I remember when I got arrested, I was in the police cell. 
very few of my family members turned up to come and look, um, to come and check out how my situation was. Um, because everybody said that I never listened to anybody. I was like dancing to my own tune because they mm-hmm. advised that I should quit journalism and I refused. So the family never was, they were never there for me. I would definitely, it's, it's hard to say, but this was the fact. When I was in exile, I, my family joined me in Senegal, but for some reason, because I wasn't working in um, full time, I couldn't sustain my family in Senegal. Dakar is one of very, one of the most expensive cities in Africa. So I had to send my family back to come and live in the Gambia so my kids could go to school, you know. Um, but throughout that time, I think less than 5% of my family members were coming to check on my family, my, my, my wife and my kids, you know, beside my dad and, and, and a very few of, of, of my, my relatives. So um, family, they just think that you are a stubborn someone who choose to, um, that dangerous path instead of having your peace and then your normal life that everybody else was going to. But I mean, sometimes it's good to be. It's, it's sometimes good to be the you know the unusual element in, in, in the family. Uh, so I I I was this one type, and I stuck to I stuck to that 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 line of work, mm. despite the risk, despite the others. Yes. If you've done over twenty years in journalism, if we are to roll back the hands of time thirty years, are you still going to choose journalism? I will choose it over and over again. I will choose journalism over and over again. I think journalism chose me. I I always say this. I always believe this journalism chose me because I couldn't figure out myself doing any other work besides journalism. I just I have a strong passion for this. I may not be rich today, but I have an indelible mark on the history of this Gambia, of this country. They can't look back and then assess, for example, the 20 years that I have been a journalist, they can't look back and assess that 20 years of Gambia governance, you know, journalism without mentioning the name of Sana Kamara. And for this, I am proud. Um, how it comes out in the future, it's in the hands of God and my own effort. But my kids are going to be proud that their father stood for the country, their father um, stood for principles of democracy, their father chose the path of righteousness and justice, and not to side with injustice and uh, uh, corruption, you know, and um, and all that vices that come along, that came along with democracy, uh, with, with dictatorship of the former regime, and and even as, as we speak today, I after the um the change of government in 20, um, 2021, after the Adam Obaro won a second term, um I was still element in his government who came and then said, you know, if you don't want to work for the president um directly here, why don't you accept to go on foreign service? I said, I'm not going anywhere. I was part of the uh, the hands that tied this lion. I'm going to stay here and make sure that the lion does his job or we're going to untie him again. So I, I, I'm i happy doing what I'm doing and I have a very strong passion for this. You resigned from President Adam Abaro's government on principle that he was deviating from what you all agreed as the kind of governance that the people of Gambia needed. If he nominates you for a national award, are you going to accept it? Uh, based on the current situations, I'm not going to accept that. Definitely, I am not going to accept that. No matter what benefits that award brings along, I am not going to accept that. I would rather ask him to respect the principles or the promises that we are made to the Gambian people um, than awarding me. I am an individual. The population is over 2 million. It's not my life. You can compare with my life versus the rest of the population. So definitely, I'm going to accept that award. How has social media changed journalism practice? It, it has been challenging for journalists. Now we have everybody participating and breaking news as it's happened. Obviously, but it has also been a blessing, if you ask me, because consumers of news um, also are interested to hear what the journalists have to say when there is a breaking news online. Okay, those who know the value of journalism, the true value of journalism, they would trust the information to come from the journalist rather than every citizen journalist out there breaking the news because they have access to internet or they have access to an Android phone. But basically, it has transformed the way news is um, uh, is delivered in the country. It has challenged the traditional media, for example. Newspapers who are publishing every morning um, in their papers um, now are challenged because they have to come up with something that has to be fresh by that morning. Mm. You know, because by then already social media has broken this news. Obviously, if you are an editor, you're thinking, what do I give to my readers mm. to consume that they haven't consumed already overnight? 
So it has been challenging. It has been challenging for the television because our television stations we have here. Remember, we had two out the Jamest era. Twenty two years, we had only one TV station. It was in twenty seventeen we began um having some new private television stations. There are a few of them available. I think about three or four that are operating right now, and they are you know struggling very hard to find their feet because it's a small market in terms of profitability and all that. But then the challenge is they also have to compete with the social media because there is Facebook Live. Remember, there is um there is YouTube channel. There are other online streaming platforms that are also there digital media. So there is competition in, in every sense. I think um it's been very challenging, but definitely it has also presented journalists with some innovative way to do news um instead of doing it the old way because definitely the old way is not going to work for for uh, for the consumers anymore. The citizen journalists, um, the, the 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 live streamers, they are taking over that breaking news part of it. You are not only breaking the news, but you need to go beyond the breaking. What do you bring? What depth are you providing in your news article that the social media um are not providing? What kind of sources are you bringing in your analysis of the news? These are things that the readers also need. You know, I am happy today. I could sit for a month or two without writing a, or without publishing a single story. But when I publish a story, sometimes it takes me a month. It takes me weeks to work on a single story. The depth, um, the 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 facts that I present, um, the sources that I put into my new story, mm -hmm. it is something that no social media journalist would be able to um 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 that can be compared to any social media journalist work. So I take a lot of pride in the work that I'm doing, and I think if you are the right journalist, you have got the right training, you have got the right abilities, you still have an opportunity. You still have a good opportunity to become distinguished among all these you know, euphoria of um, social media uh, um, taking over the traditional news channels. Will you agree to calls that journalists should be licensed? Should journalists be licensed? Um, I don't agree that journalists should be licensed. I think journalists need to have a, need to have a sort of regulatory mechanism that doesn't um, um, require them to be licensed as, as like vehicles or to be um, licensed like uh, like like TV stations. If you have a media house, probably you can get licensed as a media institution. But as a practitioner, you should be a lifelong, that should be a lifelong practice for you. You don't have to rely on a license to be able to practice journalism because journalism is very sacred in, in, in democracy. So if you want to bring the condition of licensing, it now you are given powers to the authority who is going to be licensing this journalist. That power over us is going to reduce our ability to practice this journalist because we always be thinking ahead, what is going to happen should I apply for that licensing? Can it be used as a weapon against me to either um, deny me license or can it be used as a weapon to control what I have to write or what I don't have to write? So I think the act of allowing that licensing itself is a way of censorship. So I don't believe that's what the license is. The Federation of African Journalists sued the Gambian government and you were one of the plaintiffs. How did that case, that lawsuit go? Did you get the reliefs you were seeking? I, I was a witness. I was a key witness. I wasn't a plaintiff. Uh, the strategy oh, was okay. gone in such a way that those who are physically tortured by the regime acted as the plaintiffs. Okay. And then there were a number of witnesses, and I was a key witness because I'm one of the journalists who stayed in the country during the duration when all of those things were happening. I had this ex unique experience, that unique ability to, um, my statement came and give a lot of support to all of them because I saw what happened firsthand, and my story could relate and support whatever their claims were at the, at the Equus Court. So, um, yes, I, the outcome was very positive because we won the case, and because of that, the Gamba government had to pay compensation to all those who were acted as, I think about four of them who acted as plaintiffs. They suffered very serious abuses in the hands of the state for doing their jobs. And some went, some won $50,000, others won as low as $25,000. But basically it has, impacted, it has impacted their lives after this. After this, well, because I was a witness, um, I'm proud that I have taken part in this. And some of those recommendations were we are also implemented on the ground and because it, it, it started at the time that the local press union was also um, challenging in the Supreme Court some of the draconian laws that existed. So the ECOWAS laws, uh, the ECOWAS outcome of the ECOWAS case and the outcome of the Supreme Court case that the GPU, the press union also challenged in the, in the, in the courts here, 
were all um, they all complemented each other so that um, it could form the basis for um, media reform agenda of this uh, President Barrow's transitional government. That reform agenda is ongoing. I think we've gone very deep now. We have gone very far. Um, I would say, in my opinion, I think 70% of the targets have been met, but we still have very important um, um, uh, um, pending issues that, um, that are yet to be addressed in the reform agenda. But definitely, there has been some very good progress. And um, I'm happy that my story, uh, my witness statement has helped to um, 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 impact or to guide um, that process of reform that we are already enjoying today. Uh, today, the Gambia media is very free. Um, we are hardly being arrested for reporting or we are being imprisoned or people disappearing or being assassinated for doing that work. So I think um, staying true to your profession, um, it's something that I valued and I cherish. And I'm happy that I've taken part in that process to legally challenge this case so that I don't only write about them, speak up against them, but also I have allowed myself to go to the legal, um, the legal, um, legal process to challenge them and then their constitutionality or their, um, their meeting of international um, journalism standards. So sure. definitely it was, a, it, was very, it was a very historic milestone for me as a journalist. And I, if we still have to do more of that to make sure Your mic is off. Okay. Tell me your golden memories, 20 years and more. What memories are for you the most cherished in this profession? Um, I, I, I would say that I would have loved, for example, um, the Gamma Press Union, its support from um, uh, Gamma Media Support, which is a Danish um, association, media association that partnered with our press union to help um, capacity as a journalist because the issue of training had been very, very, um, had been a very big issue for us in the past, during the past region. We had the first um, degree program in the Gambia on journalism or in journalism in 2014. Mm. Uh, but a professional course um, that was initiated in 2010, I was happy to be part of that. And you know, I was among the outstanding graduates. Um, that is one of the most cherished uh, memories that I had in journalism. That I had to wear a professional uh, graduating gown to say that I have undergone two years of professional training is a memory that I cherish. I can hardly forget this happened in two thousand and fourteen. You know, um, and then there were instances that I had written stories, and that story had immediate impact. Remember, I was in the, in the, at the independent newspaper, and a mom, a mom, a mom, a single mom came crying. Mm. Um, but, um, she had a fight with her husband, and the husband, because she was a Guinean, Guinean Sierra Leonean, married to a Gambian here, she had no family, and she was kicked out of her family of, of the of the of the marital house, mm. and the kids were um taken um she was separated from her kids that were really really young kids, you know, and then you, you writing about these kind of stories and the next morning when this story was on the headline you get a call from the inspector general of police to say that you should escort you should take the you should go with the woman to the police headquarters and then some of the police who were corrupted to uh, participate in separating this woman from her from her kids you know they got uh, um got reprimanded and the kids were returned to the woman and then he was um they were you know that kind of the way that woman reconciled with her kids these are some mm. of the takeaways that I think I believe they are so valuable mm. that um there is no there is no it's not comparable to anything. That feeling that you've been able to achieve this with the power of your pen. This is one of the greatest memories that I also cherish. Obviously, it's got um it's got the, the, the other side too, the negative side, but then this is just an example of things that I've been able to do. The story that got me um uh, arrested in 2014 impacted mm. on the whole narrative about trafficking of Gambian girls from this country to the Middle East. And ever since it has never, this story had never been at the same again. Because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, was compelled to act on this. Um, um, the, the Ministry of Interior were compelled to act on this. The Ministry of Justice, they had, an, because they were in charge of the agency responsible of trafficking and passing. So mm. it had it has compelled the entire government apparatus and Masendi to start acting to see how do they repatriate these girls, but also to look thoroughly at these agents who are operating in the Gambia. After the reporting of my story, there have been several arrests and prosecutions. 
of this person. So I think 20 years is a long time to remember all of that, but these are some things that I can just remember of Ted to say that my pen had that impact and that's where my, my that's where I derive my happiness, my joy from. And um, I think those are things that I will go to the grave with. I'm appreciating about the work that I do as a journalist in this country. Does journalism pay? Um, it depends on the pay. You mean, <laughs> do you mean finance, financial pay, or do you mean, I mean, because it look, look at it holistically. Look at it holistically for me. <laughs> um, financially, journalism doesn't pay. My mm. um, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't pay. Um, today, uh, I think I'm enjoying, I would say, quite a, a modest level of living in this country as a journalist because I have started doing media consulting so that I'll be able to pay my bills. Mm. But working in the newsroom to write stories wasn't going to enable me to look after my kids, pay good school for my kids. You know, um, I, I, can't, I, don't even own a, I don't even own a house in my country. After being a journalist for 20 something years, I don't have my own house in this country. I only bought my, my first car uh, um, about a year ago. You know, um, so all the time that I worked as a news as a news writer um, in this country, I have not been able to make enough money to say, well, actually this can happen. You know, um, of course it, it enables you to live modestly. You you know, you're not gonna stay for, but you're not gonna get picked by being a journalist unless you want to be a journalist that is going to be in the pay books of politicians or some mm. corrupt business people. But um, for someone like me, sticking to those principles, I don't think making money was going to be, you know, was going to be something that I, I deliberately, I know that that's going to be out of the question. So unless I come up with some innovative ways to make money, like um, this media consulting that I do, that organizations hire me to provide communications or visibility uh, um, 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 services for them, that is enabling me to do better, but based on news writing, definitely not. Is there any particular assignment that you will say was the most challenging for you? Uh, I think that will be several. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> 20 years working as a journalist, that, that will be several. Mm. Um, let me also highlight this, that when I was at the president of this, Part of my work as a media officer is not just to sit there and uh, the president doing engagements and then you go in there to provide coverage for them or coordinate, facilitating coverage for other media houses. I am one of the journalists who enjoy field work. There are times that I will have to uh, write to my director to say that I have, I have to go into the field to go and inspect, or um, like project monitoring. You go and look at the level of projects that were uh, financed through the government, uh, through the um, taxpayers' money. Um, and implementation in very key areas in agriculture, in, in, in energy, in education, you know. So I travel with my cameraman and uh, my driver to go into the field. I will go like an entire week. I'll be, I'll be traveling up country, mm. uh, meeting with people, getting to hear where they have to stay, why some projects are not working, what is wrong with them, and the success stories. When I come back, I document all of this and then push it forward. There are times that some of the things that I may have written probably will not be something that they might like, but I because I told I was a professional, yeah. I do I just make sure that I accurately document it the way it is. So that, mm. that's one thing that I was having conflict with working for um that, that government because um I cannot write news to praise. I, I was I was struggling to do that. That mm. was not my thing. I was trying to write news accurately as accurate as possible so that I'm not trying to blemish it to make the president look nice or to make it look, look good. Obviously I could do that but that's not where my passion lies. Right? Now, um, let's take for example the issue of um, us documenting that story that led to our arrest by the military in 20, 2000, uh, 2010 yes. uh, with my colleague. Um, if I tell you, we walked on foot for almost 10 kilometers going for that story that day. Really? Yes. And we didn't even anticipate that we were going to be arrested. We walked wow. on foot that day from our office. We just in, in Togo Star, we walked to Westfield. Westfield, we walked to traffic light. And tra I think it was a traffic light or somewhere that we had to get, get a taxi to get to the, the, the tourism area, you know. Because the fares that we are given, you wouldn't believe it. We would have gone into the field for hours. We, didn't even, we are not even given any money to even say, my water or thing for yourself while you're in the field. And this was during the heat of this one. It was really, really warm. 
it was sunny, mm. you know, that kind of thing. So we had to walk certain distances to save some of the fares so that when we are in the field, we didn't even anticipate we were going to be arrested. You know, that kind of thing. So wow. people who people who sit down and consume a finished product of the news, they had no idea what we go through to bring that news to them. They had no idea what we undergo to make sure that the news comes to them in a finished package um, 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 product. They don't have no idea. So that is one of the things that definitely I found really challenging, and I have not told that story to anyone before. Mm. Yes, I had not that had not to anybody in any interview about you know that that story. We had to walk on foot for several kilometers just to yeah. go and get the news. You know, um, there are times that you also go for coverage. Um, I remember I was attached to the president that is Yajame in 2003 when he was going for the media people's tour. It was my first experience. And then I was, because our editorial policy dictates that, dictates that when you go, uh, like if you report the news, there's a certain angling that you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to observe. Mm. You know? And we, we go with the president's delegation. The people that we are using was provided by the, the office of the president. My team members, I think there are only two of us that we are from the private media. The rest, we are all pro-government and other. At the time, it was just the point and the, at the independent newspaper. Mm. You know? But when I read my news and then the newspapers, are published in manual for some reason the analysis of their coverage was showing that there's a journalist on the tour who is still reporting very critical about what he was finding in the news where others are <laughs> reporting about the president had a very large welcome in here very big crowd he has inaugurated this project i was looking at the other side of yes. the report mm. as, a, as a result you know um when the president gets happy he has to he has a way of rewarding certain journalists. The ones that he believe are just, you know, and you are in that kind of situation, you, you have very, you have very, very few, very low budget in your pocket, but you still have to stick to the news. Because for you, the news is what matters. You don't yeah. care how much the president would give to other journalists because even they are doing so that they are doing a very good job for him. You are not working for the president. You are working for your readers. So working for your readers is sometimes it comes with great success. You know, um so I have experienced it all, but um and then the, 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 the one that got me arrested in 20, 2014, my editor in chief, um, the publisher, who was the publisher of this kind of newspaper, when I got arrested by the police, he was called to come and say that he never turned up. I slept in the, in, he only came in the morning because he feared that when he came, he was going to sleep in the cell with me. <laughs> so he never slept in the morning. I'm, I'm telling you, uh, my friend, is that he's going for news? I hope, I hope, but there is a way that we can say, okay. Um, well, obviously there is. Like now we are sitting down, and I'm proud to say that I have done all of this to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a way, but I think these stories need to serve as motivation for others to look at journalism in a way that you're driven by passion, the impact that you're going to have on the lives of the people, not the monetary benefit that your news writing is going to bring to you. Obviously, you also need to be paid for the work. You know, but the primary motivation should have to be the impact that your stories are going to have on the lives of the people. Mm -hmm. So I have I have slept in police cell. I have been arrested and then by police and several uh, another time I have been arrested by the military. But I never gave up. I mean, a lot of my colleagues gave up. They ran away, but I still stayed. You know, to still tell the news. You know that there is nothing monetary that is going to be worth me risking my life to continue reporting on the educatorship. You know, mm -hmm. under those circumstances. If I did not have that passion for journalism, and as far as I am concerned, I mean, I will stick with journalism. I can work as a media consultant here and there to make an extra bucks. You know, I mean, if I'm recruited as a professional to work in a in, in a public sector or something, um, that could also happen. But it's not going to take away that journalism beat. Mm. You know, for me, um, I think that's part of my identity as mm. a journalist. That's yeah. part of who. I am. I mean, there's not going to be any Sana Kamara with that, that journalism thing. The Gambians know me as a journalist. Sometimes I publish and they tell me, people tell me, when I was at the president's office, I was writing stories in support of the president's agenda. And the backlash I was getting online, people were saying, you are such a disappointment. You are one of the greatest investigative journalists. Now you are here, you know. <laughs> but how could I choose, to, I choose to be part of a political agenda? You know, even though I was a professional, others did not see that way. You know, because you know, remember the the former the former president um enjoyed a very good support even during the 2015 elections. Mm -hmm. He had almost 
forty percent of the votes. And those supporters were still there. Some of them were in government offices, and they still have access to social media the way you did when you were fighting against them. Mm. So they are also after you. Every time you publish something, they come and here and there. So you have to weigh between your beliefs and principles mm. versus public expectations of what you are trying to accomplish. There is a practice in Ghana. Uh, in Nigeria, they call it the brown envelope. In Cameroon, oh. it is called the brown envelope. In Ghana, we call it soli. Soli is actually the short form of solidarity. What is the name in Gambia and what is its place in the issues of corruption <laughs> and influence of money in journalism? It, 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 is, it, is, it is still here. It is still here. Um, imagine this story I told you about um, being attacked to the president to go on tour and then the president pays for almost all of that. Um, it was happening because when I was at the president's office, Maybe after I left, you know, um, I tried to do as much as possible to make sure that journalists are taken care of. When I say taken care of, when we are going, we make sure that there is transportation available for them. When they are there, when they need any of the things that they need to do their work, I make sure they are facilitated. But when I left, I started getting stories of how some envelopes are distributed among journalists who are covering the present activities. Mm. You know, but when I was there, those things were not happening. Okay. I know that some media houses, for example, during the last presidential campaign, millions and millions of dollars were distributed by the ruling party among media houses mm. so that you know they provide coverage for the president and his campaign agenda. You know, um, that is even below, that is even definitely below brand envelope. That is definitely mm. below brand envelope. Wow. Yes, and people took people took this willingly and you know without any hesitation. Mm. You know, obviously. Yes, because they felt they needed it and that they are not going to provide free services for the um, for any political. Now, what you are missing out is that the other parties who might be there and may not have yeah. the ability to pay the same now are going to be disadvantaged because you choose to hold that money. You put money before mm. the principle of providing fair, balanced, and you know, kind of um, um, news coverage. So yeah. it's happening here. I mean, you will see um, offices that were going to ask. Journalists to say, write to me that and said, provide um, a gift reporter to go and do a project visit. And throughout that thing, they're going to, they're going to be the one to pay for the, uh, the journalist's pocket money. They're going to pay for the hotel accommodation. So that, I mean, at the end of the day, obviously, the journalists, journalists will feel obliged to kind of write something that is going to be pleasing to say, who is going to be paying this. You know, so it's going to be, it's happening. I know, for example, right now we have Gambia's top telecom sector. Telecoms are the, one of the biggest advertisers in this country, besides mm. banks and then the government. Yes. Telecoms is one of the top three, top three. But in the past five years, the top telecom companies they have their, they have acquired their license to operate their own media houses. <laughs> you know, they've got their television, they've got their radios. I'm, I'm so they um I had even rumor that one of the top um, newspapers, some of these stars are bought by mm. members of. Uh, you know, uh, um, another telecom company. So they're trying to control how news is reported about them. I had this experience because when I was working uh, before going to this telecom house, I was a freelance journalist. I remember there was a story I reported about one of the telecom companies that were violating some regulatory um, requirements. Mm. And it nearly um, resulted to their license being revoked by the regulator. Okay. I could follow up this story. I've done my investigation, put this story together, and then I sent it. The editor in chief actually produced this story as a front page news item. But because the publisher was at home for some reason, he got clue that this was coming on the next day of the news. He called the office to say that that story must not appear on the next morning. You know, after working all of that. And then I later realized that there was an, uh, um, an advertisement arrangement between the media house and then this telecoms company that. The telecoms company is provided by every quarterly or so, um, some hundreds of thousands to these media houses. But one of the agreement clauses said that you cannot publish anything critical about their work or about their business. You know, the second one was one of these um, strong Jamai allies um, who had several, several shares and several businesses on the Jamai regime, mm. and then you know he was even he was even um, reported on that um, in the Panama Papers investigative collaboration. I'm um, yeah. sure about that Panama Papers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this guy also there was this um story that I have been collaborating with these guys who are doing the Panama Papers 
about that story. And when I wrote this story, and it was also supposed to publish in the same paper I'm talking about, again, the publisher called and said that we should hold on to the story. They have to get this man because the man to him was a philanthropist who supported them when they were in need. Now, to get that guy's version, obviously, it, 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 it diminishes, it undermines all the stuff yeah. that we put together. I, that, you know, there are days that I cry, you know, because I feel really bad that I've done all this work and just because they have to be compromised, because the publishers have to look at their advertisement or monitor it. So um, it, it's happening here. It's even, it's even a real issue here in the Canada. It has compromised news in many ways. The newspapers, the televisions, the radio stations, most of them operating here, I will tell you, are already compromised because of this advertisement money that, um, that they so badly need. And they're going desperately after them to get. So um, we have very few public interest publications in the country, um, and then that is something that I believe is, should be a priority if you want to um, build a Babylon newspaper in this country or a Babylon media sector in this country. You mm -hmm. need to look at public interest journalism um, as opposed to um, private independent media that want to rely on advertisement because advertisers are getting are getting very very. Um, Aware that their money has to um, earn them some value in, mm. you know, um, in how newspapers report about their business, even when they are morally and ethically plotting some of the, you know, the, 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 the requirements or the um, the laws that regulate their work in the country. My final question: A lot of political players and politically exposed persons are setting up media houses. I don't know if that reality is playing out in your country. Political ownership of the media, are we caught in trouble? Is there a reason to be worried? Obviously, like I said in the bill about, it, about the advertisers, it's the same with the political. What they are even doing, some are even working very softly because they are not coming directly to, so that people are associating them as like the owners of this media house. Mm. What they are doing is to be behind the scene and then pushing money to have very strong journalists. You know, we have seen this thing happening here. Now we've heard about it, but now we have seen evidence of it. It's coming here and it's very strong because politicians are already investing for the future. They're investing today, but they are always their objectives are in the future. I've got those kind of offers a number of times. I had to turn them down. When I left the president's office, one of the president's strong allies owns a media house in this country, called me and said they're going to offer me a job. I was called for a meeting and then they proposed that I come work for them. And then they put a car key on the table and said, you know, you should say, if you say yes, you're walking away with this car key. I said, no, keep your car key. I'm going to work to buy my own car, but I'm not going to. I worked for the president for two years, some eight months. I didn't have my personal car. I only used an office car. There are times that I will even have the office car to go and take my team members to work. I will start on the road and look for a car to go to the office. Mm. And uh, I was never embarrassed. Because for me, I saw that kind of like service to the public, not a way to get you know, that kind of. So, yes, that's one of the. There are those that also want to be affiliated. There are those who own media houses, but they are using this media ownership to buy political um, alliances with the president. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. There are those that are also out there. They want to have a say in the political future. They want to become big players and they've invested money in the media. They want to have journalists to come and, you know, understand, to work for them. Now, this is, making, this is making it difficult. That's why um, ever since I left the president's office, I haven't been employed by any media house. Mm. You know, I try to work as an independent journalist as much as I can be. I do investigative work. Some of the work that I do are not the ones that I even publish because if I want to have, a, be here, if you want to have an impact on your news, because that is, uh, if you look at the, 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 the dynamics of the news consumption here, mm. the digital media, those who could read the online news are yeah. different from those who are listening to the radio are also different from those that are buying the newspaper copies. You okay. know? So there are times you do certain kind of news, you want to target, you want to choose which medium do you want to use, which channel do you want to, you want to publish this news into. So um, there are a lot of work that I do that I'm commissioned to do and they are not being published locally here because you know they are being sponsored or they are being commissioned by you know some private or international groups that are interested in getting some impartial, you know, account of what's happening or things, you know, in the country. So I have money to at least maneuver my way around without being corrupted by this kind of uh, um, um, brown envelopes. 
but you know, like you said, it's not something that um for me um it might not be a problem. But majority of my colleague journalists are definitely falling to me, you know, because the media houses that they're working for are either owned by um a certain political interest, certain political groups, you know, and as a result, they indirectly going for those political groups. Um, so that whatever is happening, your voice, you know, can be counted as an independent voice because you, you work for no media house, you work for no political interest, you work for the interest of the country, the republic, and the people. So for me, I have been able to survive, but this is a growing trend here. Um, what is going to happen in the next five years, if you don't mind, um, you will see some new emerging um, people trying to acquire the Your hand is frozen, sir. Hello. Yes. Your end your end went off a bit. I said that uh, there are those that are uh, for example, right now there are some businesses and politicians who are already who are starting to become politicians, but they are invested in the media to form the basis of them running for political office in the future. So in the next five to seven or to ten years, you will have those people here declaring publicly declaring their intention to run for office because already they are invested in the media that is going to be laying the foundation for them to run for public office in years to come. You know, and this is very difficult. It's very serious for us as journalists because it means that you are already playing. Um, you are playing a role. Or you are being. I don't want to say you are used as a tool. I it's quite a little bit time to use. You know, for against some of my colleagues, journalists, but. You know, you are playing a role that you are not even aware that you are becoming a, you are becoming a, you are becoming a, I don't know how to explain it. You are becoming a, you are becoming a player, but you are not aware that you are being used. For a okay, so you are like a pawn in their chess game. Exactly. That's the best time. That's the time I was looking for. You are like a pawn in the chess game. But you, either you are not aware or you choose to be part of it because that's what is being built. So, obviously, you don't also want to, as a professional, you want to get paid. So this this is happening and it's quite serious because we've seen those journalists and the effect that they are having on the political discourses, and they blatantly choosing to ignore the facts and the truth in favor of what um suits their political uh, masters who are paying their who are paying their salaries and paying their bills. Thank you very much for this. This has been an exciting conversation. Sana Kamara, all the way from the Gambia joined us today on Pestown, and we've talked about his journalism journey. Uh, he's gone through a lot in 20 years and a little over, and uh, he believed that conviction and integrity matter more than material possession. Those have become abiding undertones in his professional life. Even to the point of working in the office of the president, he held on to them. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This has been passed down. We'll be back next time with another edition where we'll have another colleague join us and we'll be talking the journalism journey. Bye for now.